Welcome back to another First Chapter Friday. This week, Unwind by Neil Shusterman. If more people had been organ donors, unwinding never would have happened. The Admiral. The Bill of Life. The Second World War, Civil War, also known as the Heartland War, was long and bloody conflict fought over a single issue. To end the war, a set of constitutional amendments known as the Bill of Life was passed. It satisfied both the pro-life and the pro-choice armies. The Bill of Life states that human life may not be touched from the moment of conception until a child reaches the age of 13. However, between the ages of 13 and 18, a parent may choose to retroactively abort a child on the condition that the child's life doesn't technically end. The process by which a child is both terminated and yet kept alive is called unwinding. Unwinding is now a common and accepted practice in society. Part 1. Triplicate. Jay was never going to amount to much anyway, but now, statistically speaking, there's a better chance that some part of me will go on to the greatness somewhere in the world. I'd rather be partly great than entirely useless. Samson Ward. 1. Connor. There are places you can go, Ariana tells him, and a guy as smart as you has a decent chance of surviving to 18. Connor isn't so sure, but looking into Ariana's eyes makes his doubts go away, if only for a moment. Her eyes are sweet violet with streaks of gray. She's such a slave to fashion, always getting the newest pigment injection the second it's in style. Connor was never into that. He always kept his eyes the color they came in, brown. He never even got tattoos, like so many kids get these days when they're little. The only color on his skin is the tan it takes during the summer, but now, in November, that tan has long faded. He tries not to think about the fact that he'll never see summer again, at least not as Connor last year. He can't believe that his life is being stolen from him at 16. Ariana's violet eyes begin to shine as they fill with tears that flow down her cheeks when she blinks. Connor, I'm so sorry. She holds him, and for a moment, it seems as if everything is okay, as if they are the only two people on earth. For that instant, Connor feels invincible, untouchable, but she lets go. The moment passes, and the world around him returns. Once more, he can feel the rumble of the freeway beneath them as the cars pass by, not knowing or caring that he's here. Once more, he's just a marked kid, a week short of unwinding. The soft, hopeful things Ariana tells him doesn't help now. He can barely hear her over the rush of traffic. This place where they hide from, the world, is one of those dangerous places that makes adults shake their heads, grateful that their own kids aren't stupid enough to hang out on the ledge of the freeway overpass. For Connor, it's not about stupidity, or even rebellion. It's about feeling life. Sitting on this ledge, hidden behind an exit sign, is where he feels most comfortable. Sure, one false step and he's roadkill. Yet for Connor, life on the edge is home. There have been no other girls he's brought here, although he hasn't told Ariana that. He closes his eyes, feeling the vibration of the traffic as if it's pulsing through his vein, a part of him. This has always been a good place to get away from the fights with his parents or when he just feels generally boiled. But now, Connor's beyond boiled, even beyond fighting with his mom and dad. There's nothing more to fight about. His parents signed the order. It's a done deal. We should run away, Ariana says. I'm fed up with everything, too. My family, school, everything. I could kick a wall and never look back. Connor hangs on the thought. The thought of kicking a wall by himself terrifies him. He might put up a tough front, but he acts like a bad boy at school, but running away on his own? He doesn't even know if he has the guts. But if Ariana comes, that's different. That's not alone. Do you mean it? Ariana looks at him with her magical eyes. Sure, sure I do. I could leave here, if you asked me. Connor knows this is major. Running away with an unwind, that's commitment. The fact that she would do it moves him beyond words. He kisses her in spite of everything going on in his life. Connor suddenly feels like the luckiest guy in the world. 
He holds her maybe a little too tightly because she starts to squirm and just makes him want to hold her even more tightly. But he fights that urge and lets go. She smiles at him. AWOL, she says. What does that mean anyway? It's an old military term or something, Connor says. It men means absent without leave. Ariana thinks about it and grins. Hmm. More like alive without lectures. Connor takes her hand, trying hard not to squeeze it too tightly. She said she'd go if he'd ask her. Only now does he realize he hasn't actually asked yet. Will you come with me, Ariana? Ariana smiles and nods. Sure, she says. Sure, I will. Ariana's parents don't like Connor. We would always knew he'd be an unwind. He can just hear them saying, You should have stayed away from that Lattister boy. He was never Connor to them. He was always that Lattister boy. And to think that just because he's been in and out of disciplinary school, they have had the right to judge him. Still, when he walks her home that afternoon, he stops short of her door, hiding behind a tree as she goes inside. Before he heads home, he thinks how hiding is now going to be a way of life for both of them. Home. Connor wonders how he can call the place he lives home when he's about to be evicted, not just from the place he sleeps, but from the hearts of those who are supposed to love him. His father sits in a chair, watching the news as Connor enters. Hi, Dad. His father points at some random carnage on the news. Clappers again. What did they hit this time? They blew up an old navy in the North Akron Mall. Hmm, you'd think they'd have better taste. I don't find that funny. Connor's parents don't know that Connor knows he's being unwound. He wasn't supposed to find out, but Connor has always been good at fetting out secrets. Three weeks ago, while looking for a stapler in his dad's home office, he found airplane tickets to the Bahamas. They were going on a family vacation over Thanksgiving. One problem, though. There were only three tickets. His mother, his father, his younger brother. No ticket for him. He just thought he'd find the ticket somewhere else, but the more he thought about it, the more it seemed wrong. So Connor went looking a little deeper when his parents were out and he found it, the unwind order, and it had been assigned an old-fashioned triplicate. The white copy was already gone off with the authorities, the yellow copy would accompany Connor to his end, and the pink would stay with his parents as evidence of what they've done. Perhaps they would frame it and hang it alongside his first-grade picture. The date on the order was the day before the Bahamas trip. He was going off to be unwound, and they were going on vacation to make themselves feel better about it. The unfairness of it made Connor want to break something. It made him want to break a lot of things, but he hadn't. For once, he held his temper, and aside from a few fights in school that weren't his fault, he kept his emotions hidden. He kept what he knew to himself. Everyone knew that an unwind order was irreversible, so screaming and fighting wouldn't change a thing. Besides, he found a certain power in knowing his parents' secret. Now the blows he could deal them were so much more effective, like the day he brought flowers home from his mother and she cried for hours, like the bleep plus he brought home on the science test, best grade he ever got in science. He handed it to his father, who looked at it, the color draining from his face. See, Dad, my grades are getting better. I could even bring my science grade up to an A by the end of the semester. An hour later, his father was sitting in his chair, still clutching the test in his hand and staring blankly at the wall. Connor's motivation was simple. Make them suffer. Let them know for the rest of their lives what a horrible mistake they made. But there was no sweetness to this revenge, and now three weeks of rubbing it in their faces had made him feel no better. In spite of himself, he started feeling bad for his parents, and he hates that he feels that way. Did I miss dinner? His father doesn't look away from the TV. Your mother left a plate for you. Connor heads off toward the kitchen, but halfway there he hears, Connor? He turns to see his father looking at him, not just looking, but staring. He's going to tell me now, Connor thinks. He's going to tell me how they're unwinding me and they'll break it down into tears, go on and on about how sorry, sorry, sorry he's been about it. And if he does, Connor just might accept the apology. He might even forgive them and tell him that he doesn't plan to be here when the juvie cops come to take him away. But in the end, all his father says is, Did you lock the door when you came in? I'll do it now. Connor locks the door, then goes to his room, no longer hungry for whatever it is his mother saved him. 
At two in the morning, Connor dresses in black and fills a backpack with things that really matter to him. He still has room for three changes of clothes. He finds it amazing that when it comes down to it, how few things are worth taking. Memories, mostly. Reminders of a time before things went so wrong between him and his parents, between him and the rest of the world. Connor peeks in on his brother, thinks about waking him to say goodbye, then decides it's not a good idea. He silently slips out into the night. He can't take his bike because he had installed an anti-theft tracking device. Connor never considered that he might be the one stealing it. Ariana has bikes for both of them, though. Ariana's house has a 20-minute walk if you take the conventional route. Suburban Ohio's neighborhoods never had streets that go in straight lines, so instead he takes a more direct route through the woods and makes it there in 10. The lights in Ariana's house are off. He expected this. It would have been suspicious if she stayed up awake all night. Better to pretend she's sleeping so she won't alert any suspicion. He keeps his distance from the house. Ariana's yard and front porch are equipped with most motion sensor lights that come on whenever anything moves into range. They're meant to scare off wild animals and criminals. Ariana's parents are convinced that Connor is both. He pulls out his phone and dials a familiar number. From where he stands in the shadow at the edge of the backyard, he can hear it ring from her room upstairs. Connor disconnects quickly and ducks further back into the shadows for fear that Ariana's parents might be looking out their windows. What is she thinking? Ariana was supposed to leave her phone on vibrate. He makes a wide arc around the edge of the backyard, wide enough not to set off the lights, and although a light comes on when he steps into the front porch, or only Ariana's bedroom faces that way, she comes to the door a few minutes later, opening it not quite wide enough for her to come out or for him to go in. Hi, are you ready? asks Connor. Clearly she's not. She wears a robe over her satin pajamas. You didn't forget, did you? No, no, I didn't forget. So hurry up, the sooner we get out of here, the more of a lead we'll get before anyone knows we're gone. Connor, she says, here's the thing. And the truth, right there in her voice, in the way it's such a strain for her to even say his name, the quiver of apology lingering in the air like an echo, she doesn't have to say a thing, anything after that because he knows, but he lets her say it anyway because he sees how hard it is for her, and he wants it to be. He wants it to be the hardest thing she's ever done in her life. Connor, I really want to go. I do. But it's just a really bad time for me. My sister's getting married, and you know she picked me to be the maid of honor. And then there's school. You hate school. You said you'd be dropping out when you turned 16. Testing out, she says. There's a difference. So you're not coming. I want to, I really, really want to, but I can't. So everything we talked about was just a lie. No, says Ariana. It was a dream. Reality got in the way, that's all. And running away doesn't solve anything. Running away is the only way to save my life, Connor hisses. I'm about to be unwound in case you forgot. She gently touches his face. I know, she says, but I'm not. Then a light comes to the top of the stairs, and reflectively, Ariana closes the door a few inches. Ari, Connor hears her mother say, What is it? What are you doing at the door? Connor back hacks out of view, and Ariana t 